The reasons why you might be using 0MQ is because you're in an extremely low latency environment um, and you're not interested in any of the additional features that AMQP provides, such as persistence. So it's a very, very pared down protocol. It's, it's actually very, very close to the socket level. It's a, it's a slightly um, embellished socket, you could almost say. If you've ever tried to implement a messaging solution in the real world, you'll soon find that there are hundreds of exceptions and uh, special cases and um, parts of your problem space that are not as easy to implement in the simple model that we've just described. And the real world features that you need to implement a messaging solution are all provided by MQP. Now, I'm not going to discuss each one of these, but Persistence in particular is a very important one. Um, it's possible to publish a message with a persistence flag, which means that if the broker, for whatever reason, gets restarted, or if the operating system underneath the broker is not as reliable as you thought it was, or if there's some outage and your messages are extremely important, then those will get flushed to dusk. And when the broker starts up again, those messages will be available and waiting, and the broker will be able to um, resume where it left off. Another very important real-world consideration that you need if you implement an actual messaging solution is to be able to determine whether the broker is in a good state or not, to be able to monitor it and to be able to manage it. And the Rabbit MQ ships with a plugin that provides this feature. It allows you to inspect and manage queues, connections, exchanges, and users, and it lets you save and manage um, an entire broker configuration. So uh, MQP is general enough to let you declare resources on the fly, but if you'd rather have those be pre-declared, then this is a good solution for, um, for putting that configuration in place ahead of time. It has an HTTP API, and it has a command line tool that makes use of that API. And hopefully later on I'll be able to show you some more details about this. You can see in this example, the publish rate is about 20,000 messages per second, which is what I'm able to achieve on my very modestly specced workstation. With some tweaking, you can easily exceed this figure. An alternative way of managing and monitoring Rabbit is to use Hyperic. The Hyperic is a, a separate tool that has plugins to monitor, to monitor pretty much every operating system, database, um, application server that you can think of, and it also monitors RabbitMQ. In this example, you can see that we're tracking the resident memory size, which is gently rising, and we've got links to inspect queues, exchanges, and virtual hosts. This is another view of Hyperic, which shows us the memory consumption for each queue and the number of messages which is ready in each queue. I don't think any presentation like this would be complete without at least some mention of the cloud. And Rabbit is fully cloud ready, if there's such a word. There are three ways in which Rabbit can um, take part, and that is by simply running on a machine that happens to be hosted in the cloud. Rabbit can also provide cloud infrastructure services. A good example of this is NASA Nebula. And it could also be providing a service, a messaging service, which happens to run in the cloud in the same way that SQS does on Amazon. And we're at the moment, we um, are working on a fully elastic cloud service that is in beta at the moment. 
we're hoping will be ready very soon. This is a description or a architecture of the Nebula system, which is what NASA used to provide instantaneous, very, very um, great capacity, great computational capacity at their sites. And you can see that there's an astronomical number of moving parts that are being managed through uh, via RabbitMQ. Another very, very large scale use of RabbitMQ that we're aware of is UIDAI, which is an Indian project using open source software to provide a unique identification number for all residents for social services. It's, used, it's um, using a large number of open source software and in this case, RabbitMQ is taking part inside of the Mule ESB. This is one of the largest IT projects ever, and it's certainly the largest online identity database ever. They plan to um, peak at 200 million messages per day, and they're planning to have 600 million residents enrolled over a total of four years. So the version of MQP that's currently implemented is 091. And zero, uh, MQP 1.0 is being thrashed out at the moment. In fact, some of my colleagues are at a connectathon at the moment, which is an event to bring implementers and their implementations together to thrash out interoperability issues. And some of the very early feedback that we've received is that um, the interoperability is, has been achieved, at least at the framing level. If, if MQP version 0.9.1, if that version number was the only reason that was keeping you from investing in messaging and to explore it, then that's uh, not something that you need to hold you back. A 091 is a, is a um, iteration of the specification. It's been through a number of iterations which is completely stable. And as of now, that is something that RabbitMQ is fully and firmly committed to. If you were affected by any of the issues discussed in this presentation, then obviously do get in touch. Um, the website is the best place to do that, and there are links to our discussion mailing list and forums on there. Um, also, this presentation is going to be available from Monday, I'm told, at the URL that I've just listed there. And I see that there is enough time left for me to show you a short demo of some of the tutorials that we've been working on to demonstrate some very, very simple use cases. So the website at the moment, if you go to the Get Started section, you're going to see a couple of very, very simple um, messaging scenarios. You might have an application or you might have a situation in your own um, setup which looks like one of these pictures. And what we're hoping is that this is simple enough in enough languages that you might be able to just pick up the code and use this as a starting point. So the example that I've implemented is Hello World, which is the simplest thing that one could possibly do. And what I'd like to illustrate is the contrast, how easy it is to implement the simplest thing with the fact that this is used in cloud scale applications. So the first implementation is the .NET one. So what we have here is a sender. So this is the publisher of a message. All of this code is available on GitHub, by the way. There are a number of languages implemented, and you're more than welcome to submit an example written in your own language. And we're hoping that this will become a resource that others can reuse. So what we're looking at here is the .NET implementation of the publisher. 
The first three lines is everything that you need to set up a connection with a broker in order to start publishing and receiving messages. We're setting up a connection factory. We're setting up a connection. And from the connection, we're setting up a channel. In cases where you need to provide different authentication or your broker is not running on local host or there are other parameters of the connection that you need to set up, then that is possible. But in a case where the broker is running, running in the local machine, which it is in my case, that's all you need to get a connection going. In the next line, we're declaring the queue. The queue's name is hello. We're deciding that we want our message to be called hello world. Um, the message itself could be anything at all. It's up to producers and consumers to decide what they want, how they want to interpret the payload of the message. Anything that can be expressed as a array of bytes could be a message. Now, there, um, <clears throat> so this takes some coordination between the producer and consumer. But it's possible to use headers to actually define what the, what the message type is going to be, in the same way that HTTP uses content type. MQP can use exactly the same header. In the next line, we're publishing the message. So at this point, the broker is going to have the message, and the sender can actually disconnect, and that message will be on the broker ready for a consumer to retrieve that. Next up, I'm going to look at the consumer side in a Java implementation. So once again, getting a connection to the broker is, in this case, about two lines of code. So it's less than the .NET. We're declaring a queue as well. In this case, the queue is probably already going to exist. So no error will result. We're declaring that it exists. If it already exists, then that's fine. We're declaring a consumer, and in this case, the consumer is going to be notified of messages to that queue asynchronously. So as soon as the message arrives, I'm going to expect to be notified of that. The other way of um, retrieving messages is by polling. Um, so in that case, Consumers would need to continually ask the broker, is there a new message, is there a new message, is there a new message? Um, the better way and the more performant way of doing that is to register your interest in um, a particular queue and have the broker automatically push those messages to your consumer as soon as they arrive. In the Java code, we've got a bit more cleanup going on, and that's just because Java is slightly more verbose. So I've got a locally running Rabbit instance on this machine. And if you start up Rabbit, this is what it looks like. At this point, I'm going to send the message. And that was what was displayed on the screen. I'm going to stop this. And at this point, the publisher is actually disconnected from, a, from the Rabbit broker. As soon as I run the consumer, I see that it's received the Hello World message. So this was another example of temporal decoupling. The message was sent, and at a different time, after the existence of the producer, the message was received. So I can actually do the same thing using the Python client just to demonstrate some more interoperability. The Python client is much shorter than the .NET or the Java client. And this is the sending code. In this case, we're declaring the host explicitly. So we're saying that that needs to be local host. And we're explicitly mentioning the username and the password used to connect to the broker. Other than that, it's functionally identical to the other sender. And if I run this, I should see at the bottom here another message was received. So that's as much as I have prepared.